Hi, I'm Helen Kennedy and along with Martin Engbretsen, I've edited a new book called Data Visualization and Society, which I'm going to tell you about in this video. At the time of making this recording in September 2020, it's fair to say that there have never been so many line charts, bar charts and colour coded maps in the news as vital information about the coronavirus pandemic is communicated to the public in simple data visualisations. And at this time of massive global crisis, it feels almost trivial to talk about visual representations of data, but they play a significant social role and people's ability to make sense of them has never been more important. Proponents argue that visualizations promote greater understanding of data by making them accessible and transparent, or in other words, through visualization, it's possible to quote, do good with data, end quote, and that's the strap line of US visualization agency Periscopic. But readers of the Big Data and Society Journal will know that the benefits of data visualization are only half the story. Visualizations also do ideological work, privileging certain views of the world and hiding others. Visualizations do not offer neutral windows onto data, rather they are the result of a series of judgments and choices. And thinking critically about these issues is an important skill for making sense of data visualizations that increasingly circulate in the news, on social media and elsewhere. Research that I undertook in 2014 on the Seeing Data project found that people tend to lack confidence in their graphicacy or the combination of maths, visual literacy, language and critical thinking skills that are needed to make sense of graphs and charts. But since that research was undertaken, data visualizations have become much more commonplace, especially in simple and standardized formats. And we don't know what the actual role of these everyday visuals is in making knowledge, engagement and action possible. Nor do we know how social inequalities might limit these possibilities for certain groups. Our book, Data Visualization in Society, which is available open access from Amsterdam University Press, addresses these and other questions about the social role of data visualization. And I'm going to share the book with you now. The book looks at data visualization's increasingly everyday character and the skills and literacy needed uh, to make sense of them as they circulate. So this is how Martin and I define data visualizations in the introduction of the book. We say that they are abstractions and reductions of the world, the result of human choices, social conventions, and technological processes and potentials. They're created to facilitate understanding, to quote Andy Kirk, but they can also facilitate other things such as persuasion and storytelling. Consequently, we understand data visualizations as cultural products with distinct semiotic, aesthetic and social potentials. So data visualization in society addresses six themes, which I'll tell you about and illustrate with one example. The first theme it addresses is engagements and contexts. Where and how do citizens and publics engage with data visualizations and for what reasons? In what new social and cultural contexts are data visualizations emerging and to what ends? This visualization is from a chapter by Anna Bertie Suman about unconventional data visualizations of the Southeast Asian haze, which were produced to make visible politically masked risks. The second theme that the book addresses is meanings. How do data visualizations create meanings in the various social and cultural arenas in which they appear? And what are their discursive roles and functions? One way that they do this, argues Verena Lecca, is through lines, as seen here, which have a number of functions in data visualization, not just signaling connections. Our third theme is feelings. How do data visualizations arouse feelings in their audiences? What kinds of emotional responses are activated and to what ends? 
With this hand-drawn visualization of her own OCD, Jill Simpson around, aroused a range of feelings whilst also drawing attention to the politics of the hand-drawn. Our fourth theme is skills and literacy. What does literacy mean when it comes to data visualization and how can data visualization literacy be enhanced? Catherine Dignacio and Rahul Bhargava mobilized methods grounded in feminist theory to enable a community group to develop the skills to produce this data visualization mural. Our fifth theme is politics. What's the political significance of data visualization and in what ways do data visualizations play a role in citizens' participation in democratic systems? John Wibby and others experiment with innovative expressive techniques to grapple with deficiencies in data about race and immigration in the US and so address our theme of politics. And our final theme is aesthetics. What kinds of aesthetic characteristics do data visualizations have? Well, I think the examples that I've shown provide a range of answers to that question. In the foreword to the book, Alberto Cairo writes that he often jokes, but he also believes that a field, let's call it field X, reaches maturity when a parallel field, the philosophy of field X, springs into existence. So for data visualization to, meet, to reach maturity, we would need to have a philosophy of data visualization. That hasn't happened yet, he argues, but he suggests that we might be on the way to it with this book. Putting it another way, in an endorsement of data visualization in society, Lev Manovich says, this is the book we've been waiting for. We hope you feel the same as him. <laughs>